Hello, Hello everybody. everybody. This is Katrina, um, the Communications and Digital Strategy Manager at Chicago Votes. Thank you all for tuning into our documentary and for staying for this panel afterwards. We have uh, three incredible speakers uh, moderated by Stevie, but before we get into that, we have a brief message from Illinois House Speaker Chris Welch. One second. Give me one second.
Voting is one of the most fundamental rights we have as citizens. Being sentenced to prison should not mean being excluded from a democracy that is supposed to represent all people. People in prison are not erased from society. They have needs too. Elected officials have to fulfill their needs and they should have the chance to hold those officials accountable. The major positive impact is a more inclusive and yes, a more just Illinois. The goal of public service is to serve everyone's needs. That's easier done when people actually have a say in electing us in the first place. If we can take care of people involved in the justice system, and remember that in most cases the goal is rehabilitation, then they will be less likely to commit repeat offenses. Giving them the right to vote is one of the most basic ways we can make sure they get what they need to heal and re-enter a society that allows them to succeed. All right, I'll now kick it over to Stevie um, to start the panel. Hey everybody, um, welcome to the panel. Uh, our panel posts our first ever mini documentary. I hope you all enjoyed the production. I wanna give a big shout out Excuse me. I want to give a big shout out to Katrina Fid, who led this effort for our team. Um, if we could just give her a round of applause, you can unmute yourself, clap with the little emojis on your screen. Let's show Katrina some love. She put a lot of work into this. Great job. Woo go Katrina. Yes, go Katrina. Um, we have a special treat for everybody. We're gonna speak with some of the stars from uh, our Unlock Civics documentary. Uh, we have King Musa. Uh, King, if you could just wave your hand real quick in the air, like you just don't care. Right up. <laughs> nice, to, nice to see everybody, nice to see everybody. Uh, we got Ronaldo uh, Hudson or Turner. <laughs> Good to see you, Ronaldo. Um, we have a special guest, Willette uh, Benford. Willette, give us a quick wave. Uh, and then uh, I'm Stevie Valles. I'll be moderating tonight. Um, I was in the documentary. Uh, you may not recognize me because my hair is now gone. Uh, but I'm the same guy, I promise. Um, so yeah, let's jump into it. Uh, first, I'd like to just you know, open up some space for each of you to just kind of share your initial thoughts on the production, um, why you felt that this was so important to participate in. Um, let's let's start with let's start with you, Ronaldo. Well, first of all, it was awesome. Like, like I I was blown away with how powerful all the information is and I'm I'm really hopeful that it will penetrate hearts and decisions. I feel compelled because of being disfranchised for so many years that with every breath I have, I'm gonna remind people that, you know, people that vote make responsible decisions. And there's so many people who are incarcerated that are ready to be a part of making things work for everyone and their families. And I wanna be a part of helping that to come into fruition. That's beautiful. Will that? I just kind of will echo what uh, Ronaldo said. I think that um, the voting process is not something that you should lose once you're incarcerated. I think that um, there are very, very intelligent people that are incarcerated and I know for a fact that there are, and just to strip them of the one thing that can help them 
and assist them in their communities, with their families, with their children, and with their voice to strip them of their voice and voting their values is something that we really need to push for because just because I'm incarcerated doesn't mean like uh, Mr. Welch said that I should be erased from society. So I think that this is awesome and I wanted to be a part of it because I'm gonna be pushing for that vote on the inside. Thank you, Willa. King? Um, for me, participating um, in this documentary was just a continuation of my, 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 my journey to try to dismantle what is this, this legal system in America. So um, with, with voting in particular, I just feel as though losing the right to vote furthers the gap, right? There's <clears throat> already a physical gap when um, you're inside a prison. Um, but um, for those that we, 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 we see as uh, need to be uh, redeemed or corrected, um, losing a, your voice doesn't help that, right? We want to keep the connection to the community. We want to keep the connection to their family. We want them engaged, uh, want us engaged rather uh, to what's going on in our community because uh, it affects us. Uh, you, you, you would think that if you want me to care about my actions in my community that um, you will want me engaged in that way. So for me, just being a part of the documentary was just in every note. So uh, fighting on this level is just important. Thank you, King. I agree with everything you all said, and I'm sure everybody here does as well. Um, you know, studies have shown that 33% of people who have been released from incarceration uh, that do not receive their right to vote end up getting reincarcerated, while only 11% of people who are released from being incarcerated and have their right to vote restored um, end up being reincarcerated. So can you talk a little bit about the correlation between a person being, a person having their right to vote restored and the likelihood of their recidivism? Um, well, let, why don't we start with you? That's the 2021 thing. You're muted. Um, well, I think voting, being allowed to vote in prison, uh, it gives, it gives you a voice, you know, uh, in pushing policy and systems forward laws that will ultimately, ultimately affect our lives. And so when you allow someone to, not even allow, when you support people inside to vote, then what you're saying is that your voice matters still, even though you're behind the walls, your voice still matters. And you know, um, whether someone is inside or outside, you know, you now get an opportunity to vote your values. Data, like you said, about the 33% and the 11%. Data clearly shows that people engage civically, find meaning, purpose, regardless to where they are located. I mean, you know, take for instance, the county. People still vote in the county. You don't wipe people's voice away. Some people sit in the county for an extended period of time and every election cycle that comes around, you're allowed to vote. So being in prison or even incarcerated, some people go and do a turnaround. Uh, some people may be in there for an extended period of time, but even being inside, you still should have that fundamental right to have a voice in the laws and systems that affect you. you elected officials in Illinois, we know that the moment you step out the door, you, your right to vote is restored. So I think that even, even being inside, you should still have that ability to vote for the I'm on the zone back to vote <laughs> for the people that will ultimately affect your life I, I I don't understand it I've never understand it you know it gives those inside um 
the opportunity to educate others around them about civic engagement. You know, I just, I remember each one teach one. People that I've talked to about the voting process when I came home, really, really some family members weren't engaged in it. You know, people that look like me and Musa and Bryant, you know, sometimes think that voting doesn't matter, but it does matter. And so that is an opportunity even inside for other people to educate each other about the voting process. So I just think that having that uh, process inside is something that we can't afford to just overlook or uh, undermine or just kind of sweep, continue to sweep under the rug because people need to vote inside. It's millions of people inside, millions of voices inside that need to be able to uh, change the system and laws that affect them. So. You're absolutely right. Thank you, Willa. Mm -hmm. King. The reports to produce them um, to the public. I'm to having means my, of public education. Yeah, we hear we I hear you, but there, it sounds like there's something else. Say something again. Yeah, it sounded like I heard Brian's voice for some reason. Um, I don't know what's going on, but uh yeah, <laughs> so uh can you can you um ask the question again? I was logged out. Oh yeah. Um, so we were just talking about how I, I talked about some statistics that showed that when a person is released from prison and their right to vote is not restored, their likelihood of recidivism increases. Whereas um, when a person is released from prison and their right to vote is restored, their likelihood of recidivism decreases. Um, and so we were just talking about, you know, why, why that may be. And so while you're, while, did you get that? Uh, is Brian yeah. still, or are you good? Yeah, we good. So, um, all right, good. Yeah, I appreciate that question. So for me, again, uh, back to what I was saying, it's about uh, being engaged. It's about accountability, right? If I'm engaged and I'm, and I'm holding a, a um, elected official responsible, I feel like through pride, I will, uh, most likely hold myself and the next person responsible, right? Um, in my personal community, I'll take, I'll take the lead in making sure uh, when I see something that I've already um, addressed to elected official, let's, let's just say, you know, um, it's, just, it's, just a, it's just about um, involvement, um, the, uh, me finding importance, because a lot of times in the black community, uh, not only do we know how to use, we don't know how to use our vote, um, um, we don't feel like we are included in a lot of these elections. So we don't, we don't even necessarily uh, try to uh, be engaged. So through people in, on the inside, the importance will be they can now uh, continue to um, inform their family members, you know, inform their friends, uh, bring these issues up and show people how to make change the right way. You know, so I just, I just feel as though um, if that voice was there, uh, it's a lot of issues that will be heard. And again, we will come from a different angle. Uh, there's a certain angle that no one can imagine or fathom that someone has from the inside. And so, uh, and again, this is just, it's, it's, a, it's a, a majority, a lot of people, as Renato was saying in the documentary, that can change the outcome of a vote just by one prison. So I think that it's important that we start to include these people. Ronaldo. Yeah, like I love the fact that, uh, and I'd be reading like when I, when I was incarcerated, I used to pay attention to pretty much every election. Like most people were watching the Super Bowl, I was watching the results. And I used to be so bothered by the fact that I'm like, I'm looking, even if you look at the, the election of, of former President Donald, y'all know his name, right? He won some electoral colleges by a few thousand votes. And we have prisons, right, where we could actually flip the counties if we had the right to vote. And we could actually elect the state's attorney. And we can elect, right, judges. And we can elect. 
And so when people say like the recidivism rate drops, you know, with those who are engaged in the process is because first of all, you become a stakeholder, right? And so when you start learning about people, you start learning the policies that are affecting the community, right? And so it's 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 like, you develop a sense, it's like this, in slavery, I always go back to this. In doing slavery, the biggest issue was take away their right to learn to read, right? Which means if you can't read, you can't vote, right? And so when you when you start thinking about that, prison is designed around that same concept, right? That as long as you can't think, we'll think for you. So you are a dependent, right? But then all of a sudden, they want to take you to the gate and say, now go be independent. And then get mad at you because you practice the things that they conditioned you to practice, right? Shut up. Don't think. Grab. Fight. Wrestle. Rather than, hey, listen, you're a responsible citizen in this society, right? And your vote, your vote matters. And so I think it is imperative that people understand that people that are, have the right to vote have the right to affect the community, right? And so from, from legislators, like I love the speaker and the fact that he spoke, you know, and, and our legislators that spoke toward that fact that everyone should be given that right. But don't just talk about it, be about it. And so for me, I want people to know that I was so excited when Governor Prisker commuted me and I read on that that all of my rights were restored, right? And I was like, you mean I can vote? You mean I get to get in the next election and say to people, because I'm definitely not going back to prison unless I'm going to speak or bring somebody home. So I ain't never going back as a prisoner. The devil is a lie. But I want to be I want to go and, and talk to people about, hey, do you know who's up for election? So anyway, absolutely engage people. Right. Do not commit offenses. It's really that simple. It's that simple. When you have a stake in the community, then you act like a responsible citizen. And that's why I believe those numbers fall for that very fact. Pastor Ronaldo, uh, I want to yeah. come back to you. Uh, actually, King, go ahead. You were about to say something. Yeah, because I don't want um, uh, the queen actually text me um, to be transparent earlier. I don't want the narrative to be just because you don't vote, you are dangerous, you know, because because at the end of the day, it's still a choice, right? It's still a choice. But having that right to vote is definitely, is definitely, um, like he say, like to add to, to um, what Renato was saying, it definitely gives you a sense of responsibility. But let's not, let's not, let's not act like just because I have the right to vote, those conditions that push me to commit crime aren't there no more. They're still there. So I just wanted to just state that. And let me weigh in a minute, uh, Stevie. You know, when you educate anyone on any level, whether it's a GED or a college degree, it then, it, it's an investment to say that, you know, once I'm educated, I realize that I have choices that I didn't have before. You know, it broadens the fact that, um, you know, uh, my scope or broadens my scope on life. And then possibilities and opportunities that were never presented before I'm able to see them a little bit more clearly. It, from just going straight, strictly from not having an education to a GED, you see the you see the empowerment or or the so the the joy that someone has on the inside of just getting a GED. So imagine me uh, educating someone on that civic engagement piece and letting them know that your voice is so powerful that it can change systems and laws. You know, and I, it, I think about that 3.3 million of people that are, have a conviction in Illinois, getting those individuals, a fraction of those to show up at the polls can change things. It can, it can change voting in prison. So I just think about educating people that are, are, are uh, inside, outside, what it, regardless, any kind of education allows me opportunities and choices that I never had before. Mm -hmm. And then, and then to come from uh, uh, real quick to come from um, the, the different disenfranchised or um, the oppressed people's perspective, um, just having that, 
that skill or that tool rather for lack of a, that tool to make change that tool through through voting that's a tool to make change so this anger or this bitterness towards the man or towards that system um it gives you an avenue a productive ag- avenue on how to make change right so it's not just sitting on that energy you can actually direct this energy to the polls and um and we can and we can actually make direct change so Thank you all. So why do we feel like voting in prison, people in prison having the right to vote isn't just the standard in America? What do you think the reasons for that are? Ronaldo, you wanna go first? Yeah, well, I wanna just briefly make a point because I think that's important. I don't think because someone don't vote there are monster or that they will commit an offense. But I do think that when we're not engaged, right, it's a potential problem, right? But now that being said, which it can be a different conversation, but because we're talking about the right to vote, voters get to decide who the governor is, right? And so as we're fighting to bring people home, as much as I'm talking about voting in prison, I want to see them all home so that we don't have to be having a conversation, bring our people home. That's my personal uh, philosophy. But I know that until we begin to empower the people, like when the sister said, each one teach one, each one reach, because I learned those skills as well. And I was one of those persons that went to prison and was incarcerated and couldn't read or write. And so when I learned to read, right, I started to feel like sister was saying, hey, wait a minute, I can make a different decision. And so when I earned my GED, I really got excited because I began to read even more. And so I started reading the Illinois Constitution. And I said, hey, wait a minute, I'm a slave. (laughs) And so I was like, that's why, brother, when you was talking about in the documentary, they paid you $18 a month. They paid me $14 a month. It's because under the Constitution as it exists, right, they could get away with that. But if we had the right to vote, then we can push those issues. But if you're not engaged, right, that's why I think it's important. But ask that question again, man, because I think I went on a rabbit trail. Uh, What was your specific (laughs) question to me? No, you're good, Pastor Ronaldo. You know, uh, Dr. Rivers said in the chat she was waiting for the collection plate to get passed around. (laughs) And we do need to raise funds. It's so important. Like, you know, cars don't move without gas. So this movement will not move without donations. It's that simple. Stop playing with people, right? If you care about it, cash the check. But real talk, right? I know and I believe that it is imperative that we continue these conversations so that people can see, look at me. I did 37 years. I'm not dangerous. I'm free because of great work that people did, right? And they're continuing to do. And I have to do my part in voting and looking at who's the state's attorney, who's the judge, we can't say this stuff enough, right? So when we look at that stuff, it's important because those people and those legislators will only respect those that go out and say, I'll challenge your job. I'll challenge you sitting as the speaker if you don't listen to our voices. And so that's why they take voices from people. They do censors in these counties, right? Which mean if they're doing the census, they're trying to calculate federal funds or state funds. But we not, we're being counted for the census, but we're not being counted for the vote. And that's the type of stuff people need to understand. All across Illinois, that happens. Yeah. So, you know, the question, oh, I'm sorry, we'll let, go ahead. No, go ahead and ask the other question. I'll weigh in. I'll weigh in with that too. <laughs> Um, The other question was, why is it that voting in prison isn't the standard now? What specifically are the are the barriers that we're facing uh, uh, to make it so people in prison have their right to vote? Somebody dropped in the chat racism, one word. But I want to go ahead, Willette. Why don't you why don't you kick us? I I, I think. You know, voting in prison, you know, we've seen some of the most harshest voter suppression uh, laws get passed within the last couple of months. And the reason being is 
let's just call it what it is, white supremacy, you know, period. And so because whenever white supremacy is challenged, they change the rules because all the rules are made up anyway. And so when that, when Georgia was flipped, the, they went into they went into such an action mode to oppress a vote. And, and that is the thing that is really driving this. To, whenever you lock someone up and lock up their vote, I get an opportunity to begin to pass whatever I want to pass because an entire community, an entire we already know which communities it affects the most. You know, because we look at mass incarceration and we know what a communities it affects the most, black and brown communities, disproportionately. And so whenever a community is disproportionately affected like that, and the vote is affected, then resources are affected. And therefore, people cannot access the things that they need. So it is a, it is a, a, it is a way to oppress people in a way where it, you'll, you'll hear other people that have been inoculated with white supremacy tell you, pull yourself up by your bootstraps. But it's difficult when your bootstraps have been cut off. You know, you don't have any bootstraps. And so there are, I think that the oppression and the voter suppression because of white supremacy, that is the reason why. And it is a hurdle to overcome because it is our job as registered voters now and those who have been formerly incarcerated to build that voting block in a way where people that, where people that are elected officials know just like the LGBTQ community, it's impossible for us to ask for a phone call and you tell us, no, we're not meeting with you today because the seat might not be there next election. So that's the kind of voting block we need as formerly impacted individuals and also to be able to assist our sisters and brothers on the inside to get laws changed so that they can be able to vote too. Man, we got a bunch of preachers in the in the house tonight. You know, Bring, bringing the word. Appreciate you, sister King. Yeah, and um, I mean to add to that, <clears throat> when you think about when you think about the history of this country, right? And you think about um, the like somebody said in the chat, uh, racism, or let's take it back to slavery, right? So as the country evolved, um. They tried different ways to, to try to um, disguise the, this system, um, um, to disguise their hatred. And so um, when, you, when you got that in the constitution that you can be a slave as long as you locked up, <laughs> you straight, you can be a slave as long as you locked up. So now it's like, okay, we don't want these people in our country. We don't want them with a voice. We don't want them to have a say in our democracy. Um, the best way to do it is take their rights away. And, 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 the, and the only place we could take their rights away is prison. So then we funnel all of the laws to make them go to prison, right? We make the, we make the society uh, funnel them to prison. Now we lose our, our right as a citizen again. Now we, in their mind, remember, they, they, they wanted to see us as, as, as three fifths of a man. And so um, in order to continue this mindset, that's just another way for me to, to if, 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 if your voice or your worth is your vote um, in this democracy, if you don't have that no more, uh, then that's exactly what they want. So they put you in prison to where it's legal for them to um, express this or, or for them to um, keep this going. So it's, for me, it's just the evolution of, of, of racism. Like I said in documentary, it never stopped. It just evolved. Um, and this is just another way. Take, their, take, take your, voter, voter, uh, your voice away, take your vote away, you know? Yeah, Ronaldo. Yeah, I agree with everything that was said. It's like our system has been so crafty in making the incarcerated population the monsters that everyone should fear. And so what makes it so easy for them to say, hey, don't worry about them, is that people have built their careers on pointing us out as monsters. 
You know, there's nothing redeemable about you. You can't be rehabilitated because it's in your nature just to be a criminal. But actually, it's in my nature to be brilliant, to be a scientist, to be a doctor, to be a voting person, right? And so I I, I, I err on the side of, I'm still hopeful that our, our, our state will in, in, reinstitute the right to citizens, no matter where you are. You, if you are a citizen, then you have the rights of citizens across the board. And so I know racism plays a major role in it, but I think systemic racism is something that has to be uprooted out of the system that even people of color have adopted. Because if we look at our legislators, you have to be honest, like what are the numbers? And who are some of the hardest people making the hardest decisions? And so we have to tell the truth and not just, we have to talk about systemic racism and white supremacy, but we also have to talk about the people that sit silently, that looks like us, but don't vote like us, you know? And so I want to make sure I share with people because I want to be a part of that, that block sister. So I'm voting like we're going to get together and talk about that so that we actually formulate a coalition that talks about our individual ideas about what we want this state to look like. Right. So I would love to be able to say, man, all of the prisons are voting today. Right. And so we put an information package together to inform them. Who's sitting on the Supreme Court, the Illinois Supreme Court and the appellate court and the circuit court and who's running against Kim Fox and who's running against my governor, Pritchett, for the record, and Julianne Strider, right? They're my people, right? But I'm like, they want, like, at least they're giving the impression that they want to get this bill passed, right? And so let's say to them, let's get it there. Let's get it to them so that they can show us that the muscle is there to make it happen. So I just think it's just a matter of racism and our inability to turn on enough lights. Let's keep the lights on. If we turn the lights on and never take the lights off of them, we'll get it dead. And I think a lot of times we err on the side of thinking that people inside aren't informed or people inside are asleep to the election process. You know, there are election judges inside. You know, uh, I, I think that as we err on that side, we shape this conversation as if people inside are not really engaged in the, the, the process, the process of democracy, because they are. I was. You, that's why 30 days after I got out of prison, I was at the election booth. I met my, my first boss at the election booth who was an alderman, had a bird's eye view of the voting process and how people in office view people that vote. And so we are, but I already knew to a degree, but not to the degree that I learned over that time. And so I think that we, we think that people inside aren't engaged in that process, but to be able to get voting in prison, that is going to take people power. And I, like you said, that voting block is the people power, some of the people power that we need to push this across the finish line. So I just really believe that um, we should never err on the side of believing that people inside are not engaged. Beautiful. You know, I'm gonna ask a few more questions, but I wanna take this opportunity uh, since we've been talking about the bill to talk a little bit about the voting in prison bill that's moving through the legislature. It's House Bill 1872. Um, at the moment, it's in the Rules Committee in the House of Representatives. Um, where we're at in the advocacy process is we are, needing to secure 60 commitments from legislators that they will vote in favor of this bill. And if we're able to show on record that we've talked to 60 legislators in the House of Representatives that say that yes, they will vote for this bill, um, then we can get it onto the House floor, voted out of the House floor 
and over to the Senate where we got to do it all over again. Um, it's crunch time. We have until June to do this. Um, so I encourage everybody here, if you have relationships with lawmakers in Illinois, uh, please reach out to them, uh, get their commitment, ask them to become a co-sponsor, ask them to ask their colleagues to vote in favor of the bill. Um, by our count, if everybody in the Black Caucus, the Latino Caucus, and the Women's Caucus votes in favor of this bill, that will give us 59 yes votes, which means we only have to convince one more person to vote in favor of it. And there are 75 Democrats in the House of Representatives. So the numbers are there, uh, but our Speaker of the House, who you heard from to begin this panel, um, supports this legislation. He just needs what is known as a roll call. We need to show him a roll call of 60 legislators who were voted off the floor, and he's committed to bringing it to the floor for a vote. Um, so with that being said, I'd like to ask uh, another question, and then I think we're going to turn it over to the audience if people have some questions that they would like to ask our panelists. Um, and this question is, I, I would like for you all to share from your perspective, the impact on America's democracy, Illinois' democracy, Chicago's democracy, as a result of people in prison not having the right to vote. Like how does that affect our democratic systems in this country? Uh, King, why don't we start with you? I see you looking off, it looks like you're in deep thought. So if you need to pass it and we come back, that's cool too. Yeah, I mean, um... Yeah, because I'm really, I will, I will just probably just reiterate what was already said when it comes to that. But um, I want to ask some ideas, just think about um, when it comes to the voting in prison aspect of things, right? Um, and then we'll let, and, and, and Renato probably can bring back to your question. But when you think about uh, veterans that have lost their life or veterans that then fought for this country, rather, and um, so they come back and they come to society and they commit a crime for whatever reason, then they end up in prison. Their voice is gone, right? These are the individuals that literally fought so that we have liberty, freedom, and everything else in this country, but yet they don't even have the right to vote right now. You know, they sitting in a cell without, without this right that they fought for, um, which, is just, which is just crazy when you think about it. Um, and then another thing uh, to reiterate um, something that we talked about uh, well, my job is that uh, the women, the women, uh, the 80 percent of mothers that are incarcerated, um, whose, whose children um, are being governed by people who they can't hold responsible um, in no way, shape or form. So I just feel like it's just a lot of reasons on why this voting in prison should be a thing, because um, people are people, no matter if, if rather I'm inside an institution or inside society. Uh, uh, my morals, my values uh, are still there, you know? And there, there's a million, um, million reasons on why we should have th this right. And so I just wanted to touch on that before uh, we go any farther. And so, yeah, you can ask the question again and I'll let them uh, answer it. Thanks for sharing that, Ken. Um, the question was, what's the impact on our democratic systems when people in prison are not allowed to participate as, as voters? Um, whoever wants to go first. It looks like Ronaldo's what, unmuted himself, so. Yeah, yeah. Because what, it, what happens is it breaks relationships, you know? Like broken relationships are a part of why people re-offend the brokenness. And so when you're not engaged or you don't have access to be in relationship, voting, gives people access to relationships. Relationships build community and upholds communities. And so there is a connection to that. You know, there is a connection to when you're sitting in a prison cell and you're watching the world move past you and you're like, I don't have a, I can't say anything about this. The least of us is, so if the, if the least of us is being ignored and beat, beaten down, it affects everyone. 
at some point we have to recognize that we're all interconnected on some level. And so when you disenfranchise anyone, you're disenfranchising the whole of us. And so I believe that society, and especially in Illinois, that Illinois is nowhere near its best because the least of us are not able to express their rights and their opinions as to who will represent us. What happens when you strip someone of their ability to vote is that you exclude millions of individuals from the decision-making process. You know, that not only just the decision-making process that affects their lives, but it affects their children, families, communities. Then resources are divested out of the communities. Those with low propensity turnout which result in poverty stricken areas and elected officials overlooking those particular areas, especially when it comes to investing dollars. When individuals return to these areas, they are then criminalized for surviving in poverty that they are forced to live in because you have stripped them of the one right that could change their condition. And that is the right to vote their values and use their vote as their voice. So that's what happens when you don't allow people in prison to use their voice as their vote as their voice. You strip them, you strip their families, you begin to strip communities. Everything is stripped away because that is the intention of putting someone in prison and not allowing them to vote. Is to begin to just slowly, it's a slow civil death of communities and families, everything. That's what happens. Thank you for sharing that. I know Dr. Rivers appreciated the, the phrase civil death that you just dropped, so thank you. Um, so why don't we take a quick question from the audience. Uh, I know Bryant, you you DM'd me in the chat that you had a question. Do you want to ask? <laughs> yeah, 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 I got me there. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I have a question. <laughs> um, so Ronaldo King Musa will will add. Um, I was wondering if you guys could speak maybe towards the medical aspect towards this and how important it is. Um, to those who are medically vulnerable right now in our prison system, um, restoring their right to vote. Um, and, you know, just a little bit about what you guys saw um, during the course of your incarceration uh, uh, to those who were medically vulnerable and, you know, suffering, you know, dying in there. Um, you know, these are our families, our friends that, uh, you know, um, mean the most. So if you can speak a little bit about that, just to give the audience a clarification about, you know, how tragic it is and, um, you know, how this is big and, uh, you know, transform transforming the way that, you know, um, we're treated inside uh, correctional facilities. Well, I mean, um, <clears throat> First off, it's just it's, it's another issue that <clears throat> um, that people on the inside can't express. People on the inside can't hold an elected official responsible, um, who might have even used this as a as a uh, as a campaign tool um, when it comes to individuals in prison and pr people's in uh, in prison families. Um, they even use these as uh, campaign tools to convince our family to vote for them, and then never follow through with care. Um, uh, or, or follow through with making sure that um, what they what they said uh, in the first place is, st is stood on, right? So the conditions that man that I didn't see inside of Dixon um, is inhumane to say the least. Um, but these individuals don't have a voice; they can't call and 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 an elected official or even um, speak speak on behalf of what's going on to see change, right? To want it. So it's just like, it's just a hopeless situation. Um, I can only imagine being some someone um, who was directly affected in that, in that manner 
um, and not have a voice to scream out and not be able to say uh, that we need help, like, you know? And so it's just a continuous cycle of, of, of um, oppression. And so, uh, I mean, it's just, it adds, for me, it just adds to the fact that we need those individuals just as well as the individuals who, uh, who are not medically um, ill or whatever the case may be, just need a voice. You need a voice when you're going through stuff like that because the world don't know this is happening, but it's happening, you know? And so, uh, yeah, so I just think that it's just so important. It's so important. You know, I, I thought about um, housing being uh, just a basic necessity of life. Healthcare, I don't care where you are, healthcare should be that basic necessity, not, not just any healthcare, quality healthcare. Just because I am incarcerated does not mean that I am sentenced to a death penalty by, by, by negligence that you neglect to give me the things that I need to have a quality of life on the inside simply because I am incarcerated. So anyone that believes that is not someone that is, is fit for an elected official's office or any, any kind of office, whether it is the director of an institution, whether it is the administrator over the healthcare unit, Whatever it is, if you feel as if you need to scrimp on my health care simply because I am in prison, then you, you. Anyway, you know, that's just something that is should be afforded to anyone. You know, even coming out, you know, having that challenge with health care. Health care shouldn't be something that everyone has to struggle with people that are in office or in authority should make sure that people, regardless to whether you are poor or wealthy, and in our nation, we already know that the wealthier you, wealthier you are, the more extended life uh, is determined that your life is extended by at least 10 or 15 years because of where you live. But that should be something that should not even be a question on the inside that you should be afforded decent quality health care, regardless, simply because you're a human being. I wanna uh, jump in real quick um, and uh, pass it over to Bianca, who's a formerly incarcerated mother. And she, she would like to speak on this and she's in the audience. Uh, Bianca, you can unmute yourself and share your thoughts. I, I just wanted to say, so I did 12 years and um, back in my day, I, I'd been, I did time in Dwight, obviously, um, Logan, Dixon, um, but I wanted to say as far as like medical, like, first of all, like the whole damn prison is supposedly bipolar, right? Like, you know what I mean? Then they're, they're getting this head count with the psychiatrist giving all these meds that are really not needed, right? So, um, but, but what is really horrendous, and, and, and this is just one incident, there's millions, but there was a lady that I was very good friends with. We were on the same unit. Her name was Jerry. <coughs> she, had, she had a 60 year sentence. So she had to do 30 years. Um, and she did like 27 and then became sick with, with liver cancer. You remember her, right? Well, yeah, that, that, was, that was my buddy. I cried and cried. But anyway, the bottom line is that um, during that time, there were legislators that were like running platforms on like, if you were elderly and like something was wrong with you, that, you're, that you could get out like those couple of years early to be able to go home and die with your family. You are, you are no longer a threat to society, whatever the, you know, your crime was, right? So with Jerry, they did nothing. And I swear, and I, I, I was one of those that was always in the libra law library and I'm trying to, you know, make a change even though I had no voice, right? But um, I was writing and writing and writing and, and everybody was saying that's not gonna help her, right? But the bottom line is that she died she find, you know, she died in prison and um, had uh, during her 30 years, her elderly parents who, you know, as 
as time went by, came and visited her every month or twice a month and were very supportive of her. And it was so heartbreaking for anyone who knew her. She was one of the most wonderful people. Like, you know, um, I can't say enough about her and I want to tear up right now. But but the bottom line is literally she was like two years from her out date. And she um, was diagnosed because they don't give proper medical care there. So she, by the time she was diagnosed, after complaining and complaining for like years, right, um, she finally, they finally found that she had um, some goofball hospital where they should have taken her to an actual University of Illinois or something. But anyway, stage four liver cancer. And I was even to the point where I was telling the prison, I'll donate a quarter of my liver if, if it were compatible. Like I was trying everything, right? And um, and at, anyway, um, they could have let her go. And these legislators that ran on this platform of elderly, by this time, this woman was like, you know, I, she was older than me, but she was probably, and this is some, like I've been out of jail, out of prison for almost 11 years, but, but I'm saying that, so this is a long ago. So she probably at that time was probably like 65, 66 when she died. And um, there was nothing, just they kept that left, left, like they weren't even giving her pain medicine. I mean, really just like an IV with fluids or something. And um, the nurses in the healthcare at Logan that knew me and, you know, knew I had good intentions would let me like sneak back there for a minute, you know, and make her laugh or something. And she'd go, oh, Bianca, I knew if anybody could get back here, you'd figure out a way to get back here to cheer me up, you know? And then as the time went by, I mean, she, she died, you know, and that could have been avoided had there been the accountability for those legislators who ran on that platform of if you're elderly in prison and you're close to your outdate after doing 30, 40 years, you can go home that last year or six months or two years and die peacefully with your loved ones, your family, your children, right? And um, that that never happened for her. Sadly, her mother died while she was in prison, but her father was still alive. And, and it was really sad. So we had to hold these legislators accountable. And like um, King said, they run on these platforms that they're going to help um, incarcerated people or incarcerated mothers. And I can tell you, I um, was really lost to the streets in the west side of Chicago on the project. So the thing is that, you know, I made my own choices. I had to pay the consequences. But um, during the time that um, when my children were little, I couldn't even get the state to drive the four hours to Logan so I could see my children, you know. And, and I do, I did see a lot of, um, you know, and, and I know I'm, a, I'm Sicilian and I, and I don't know what it's like to be black, but I do know what it's like to be the mother of a black son or black daughters. Right. And so therefore I feel I have a little more of an insight than, you know, many people. And we have, we have to continue talking about this and we have to make sure because these just, I, I actually come from a disenfranchised community on the west side, the village projects. And, you know, so I, I feel like, you know, nobody does anything. We lose our voice. We, we're not engaged. We're not invested in our community. So when we get out, if we don't have that, like, well, not said, like, I was so happy to get a GED in prison, right? And then that was like, like, epic for me that like I had a GD, right? So so we have to we have to keep talking. And I want to thank all of you for the work that you're doing and anything you need from me. I'm here and bravo to all of you. And um Ronaldo, my God, your story is like so, you know, and man King, all of you, you know, well Matt, um I remember you. So it's good to see you. But anyway, so that's all I have to say. The medical is horrible. They don't care. They rather just put the whole prison on Depricote and keep you quiet so that way you won't really, you know, engage or know that like, you know, and all of us who have been incarcerated and, and had that chance to get out have far exceeded any expectation of a person who was incarcerated. Like look at King in the one year that he's been out, everything he's accomplished. And God bless you, Ronaldo and Wilmette and everyone. I have seen people who have gotten a chance and somebody believed in them that like went like all out into like making huge differences in the communities and also within the prison system. And that's all I want to say. Thank you. 
Thank you so much, Bianca. We appreciate you and you being so vulnerable and sharing your story with us. Um, we're uh, at the top of the hour. Um, I do want to uh, give our panelists some space to just say some words. Um, Jennifer Sobel, our sister, she, I see her unmuted. She turned her camera on and unmuted herself, so I know she wants to speak. So we're going to let her say a few things. I'm sorry, I ordinarily wouldn't do this, but you're talking about medical release and there is a bill, it's through the House, it's onto the Senate, it's HB 3665, the link is in the chat to slip. It creates compassionate release in Illinois. It's a 90 day start to finish, it's super tight, it's super broad. There are very few, um, everyone would be eligible as long as they're terminally ill or have a permanent disability. Um, we wrote it, I wrote it <laughs> with Chicago Appleseed and FAM, Family Against Cancer Minimum. So unlike other bills in other states, it should work. It's been written to work. Um, so if this is an issue you guys care about, it's happening now. The next hearing is on Tuesday. So I will turn it over to my mom for a little bit. Thank you for this beautiful documentary. Thank you, Jennifer. We love Jennifer Sobel and Illinois Prison Project. Awesome organization, awesome woman. Um, all right, uh, so yeah, let's hear some final words from our panelists, uh, then we can sign off, Ronaldo. Yes, yes. First of all, I love all of you all, but I have to tell you just briefly, I witnessed so many horrific, you know, losses during the 37 years of my incarceration. And so when people talk about the horrors of being sick and being misdiagnosed uh and just some something just it's just horrible 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 you know and so not having the right to vote make i remember so many staff members over the years would say things like y'all don't count don't nobody care no one's listening to you all and so when people talk about well why does this stuff matter because we want to change that narrative and I just want to make sure I remind people, you know, that we've lost so many because of the loss of voice. And if we want to stop seeing people die by incarceration, then we need to make sure people are able to vote and people know that they matter. You know, my life matters. You know, all of our lives matter. And so if I leave you with anything, I just want to make sure all of us are committed to that change that we've been talking about all night and that we've been hearing about. And so each one of our voices matter and everyone that is incarcerated voice matter. And that's why everyone should have the right to vote. Even if they choose not to exercise it, I still wanna make sure you have that right. And so I love all of y'all and thank you for listening to me and listening to us because it is imperative that we listen to each other. So thank you. Well, let I just want to say that um, you know, in in response to um, what uh, Angelia said, and you know, just Brian and Ronaldo, that you know, our me, Brian, and Ronaldo's stories are incredible, but they shouldn't be the rule. They should be the rule for everyone coming out of prison everyone coming out and everyone inside should be able to live with dignity. And so uh, having the right to vote, you know, restores that dignity that I am in, I'm, I'm engaged in a process that affects me and my family, my children and everyone else. And so I, if I had anything to say, don't let a few stories be the exception. As a society, we should continue to work for people that are returning to our communities, that setting them up for success should be the rule. Okay. Most definitely, most definitely, most definitely. Uh, I, I just wanna say, I appreciate this opportunity. Uh, I hope that, uh, <clears throat> More of these opportunities are, are presented for individuals like me to uh, help change the narrative because 
I just, I feel like once the world sees the intelligence, the brilliance, I saw in the chat, uh, people were just saying they appreciate the panel and that it was just so much insight and so much uh, things said that helped change their minds. Um, my, me as an artist, um, my personal goal is to help change narrative um, on a mass scale to where we can then, cause I feel like once people in prison are seen as people, then it will be easy for a person to vote for someone who um, who feel as though you know these uh, uh, the laws should be not as harsh for individual prison. I feel it'd be easy, right? Because once your once your heart is changed and you start to see those that's um, not just like a monster or a number or money or a dollar sign, and you start to see those individuals that's, uh, incarcerated as people, uh, we will start to see policy changing. Uh, so I appreciate spaces like this that gives those who don't know these individuals like Willette, like like Bianca, like Renato, Bryant are inside a cell right now, you know, and they deserve um, uh, not to be in prison, you know, wholeheartedly. I feel like I feel like um, uh, a new a new way of, of 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 treating someone who commits a crime. The response to someone commit a crime will be different rather than just lock them up and throw away the key. I think once hearts are changed, we will start to be like, okay. We can start to um, implement different practices uh, to where um, 25 years in prison isn't the answer to a 14 year old who had a gun, you know, um, and not to even to make it that personal. But but it's just like uh, I feel as though like changing narrative is is the start. So I appreciate this. Thank you, King. Um, thank you, everybody, for joining us. Thank you to our panelists. Um, Again, we are working to pass voting in prison uh, in Illinois. Uh, if Illinois passes this bill, Illinois would be the third state to allow for people to vote while they're in prison. We'll also be the biggest state. Um, we would re-enfranchise close to 30,000 people. Um, and it would be literally a, a constitutional shifting bill. Um, so we're asking that everybody please uh, support us in those efforts in whatever way that you can. Um, you can. You can donate to Chicago Votes. Um, you can call your lawmakers. We also have a very big uh, lobby day coming up next week on Tuesday, Operation VIP, Operation Voting in Prison. Um, thank you, thank you. Katrina just dropped the link for, I'm sorry, the virtual action is on Wednesday evening. My bad. Actually, is the lobby, the lobby day's on Tuesday though, right, Katrina? Maybe, Katrina, you wanna unmute yourself and speak a little bit to the lobby day? Yes, I can. Um, the uh, Operation VIP, that's our virtual action event, that's gonna be on May 19th. Um, from, let me double check here. I think it's from five to 6.30 PM. Um, and we're all gonna be there speaking and giving you all the tools you need to reach out to your lawmakers. So we'll help you find your lawmaker um, and help you craft your language so you can urge them to support the bill. Thanks, KP. Thank you everyone again. We appreciate you. Uh, round of applause for our panelists, everybody on the call on the panel today and the Zoom today who is formerly incarcerated. We appreciate you. Uh, we're happy that you're home um, and we're gonna be working hard to bring more people home and uh, give them a voice in our political systems. Uh, but we need you all to lean in and help us out to make that happen. So thank you all. Have a wonderful evening.